like, is anyone alive out there? Please, like, can I pick up anyone to play on my roster? You're listening to Let's Talk Fantasy Football, where men of fantasy genius have realized. Hey, guys, we don't need real football skills to dominate on the fantasy field. So slap on your pads and grab your helmet. Shit's about to get real. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Let's Talk Fantasy Football. I am your host, Nick Shrek, and joining me tonight is Matt Rogers. Matt, you are here for the second episode in a row. We're going to wrap up the preview, and I hope you're doing a little better this time because I know last episode, we both were hurting a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the pain is still there, but it's not as fresh, so I'm, I'm in the healing process, I guess you'd say. Okay, well, it's a step forward. It's better than a step back, so I'll take it. We're moving the right way. And uh, we are on to the games for the second half of week nine. But first, Rogers, let's give a shout out to Bench Boss. They're still the revolutionary app that allows you to play fantasy football live while watching the game on TV. You can predict the plays, the result of the play, and literally play fantasy football. You can sign up for the beta now by going to let's talk fantasy football.com backslash bench boss. So with that, Rogers, we're going to skip over news, anything else going on. We're going to go right into the games. Uh, for anyone who's just tuning in and is not aware of the bye weeks, Chicago Bears, Cleveland Browns, Los Angeles Chargers, Minnesota Vikings, New England Patriots, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so lots of big names out. We've already talked about a bunch of names that are questionable in most weeks to even talk about, uh, but we are recommending them as plays here because we have no other choice. Our hands are literally tied and we keep going back to the Carolina Panthers. So I'm sure we will go back to that. Well, on the podcast here, Rogers, let's start with the Indianapolis Colts at the Houston Texans and let's kick it off with the Colts. Uh, big piece of news. Andrew Luck on IR out for the season. Obviously he hasn't been here, but uh, is surprising. I think to hear he's not going to play at all this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I bet Colts fans and, you know, fantasy Colts owners are very happy they made that trade for Jacoby Brissett. And uh, word word is now they've been working out backups and the front runner to be the backup is the ever looming Josh Johnson. Always finding his way as a backup for a quarterback. And I, I really, truly just think that that's the case because he plays similarly to Jacoby Brissett, if you can if you can say that, I guess. Yeah. more than anybody else. And, uh, you know, it makes sense, but just a little tidbit, not really fantasy relevant. But important enough to uh, to share with, with the LTFF uh, fan base. Um, you're not doing anything with Jacoby Brissett here as you go into fantasy relevance, right? Um, not really. Uh, the Texans are pretty decent against quarterbacks. Uh, Jacoby Brissett, he has that decent floor. He's been putting up pretty, like, double-digit double digit points consistently, but I don't really see a, uh, a huge day unless he gets a rushing touchdown. Fair enough. I mean, like fair enough. He's going to have you, you assume the attempts in this game is going to be, he's going to be chucking the ball. But uh, again, until we see it be more reliable, I don't think it's your option. But again, we've talked about some bad QB streaming options this week. So who the, who the hell knows you want to roll the dice. Uh, you definitely can do it here. Let's talk about the running game. Frank floor in Marlon Mack. We watched Marlon Mack get in the end zone. Um, he's, he looks electric in the touches that he's getting. He's averaging 8.8 touches a game. Um, I think that's what, since returning from his injury in week five. So again, that's relative. Um, Gore had his biggest game of the season in week eight. Um, so do you trust either of these guys? Cause Mac, we've seen, you know, we've advised people to play him on the chance that he gets the, he breaks away the touchdown. He has the speed, which he did last week. Um, and then Frank floor is, you know, that's that's typically what he is. He's Frank Floor minus last week. Yeah, we, we talked about in the last podcast how shitty the flex uh, situation is for pretty much everybody. I'll tell you this, though. You, you said uh, the, the the stat about 8.8 touches for Marlon Mack, yep. Mack pretty much in the last month. He's averaging 60 yards from scrimmage on those touches. So you know that I hate Chuck Pagano. I've said it on past podcasts. Not really sure how this guy still has a job. But <laughs> feed Marlon Mack the ball. I know Frank Floor is putting up that floor, just came off a big game. I'm actually – so, Shrek, if you listen to the last podcast, not to get too personal about me the same league that I am starting Curtis Samuel in I am also starting Marlon Mack and that is because and this is a seven and one team by the way I have Le'Veon Bell on the bye Keenan Allen on the bye Kelvin Benjamin not playing a bunch of shit came out of nowhere Deshaun Watson but I'm actually playing Marlon Mack and the reason that I am is because I am just praying that maybe this is the game that they just start to feed him a little bit more I mean he's the youth he's the next guy up 
You know, you know, you know what you sound, man. You know what you sound like, Rogers. You sound like the Nick Shrek of old, and really the Nick Shrek of current, who has been banging the drum for Frank Floor to fall off the face of the earth every year, every year since we've been playing <laughs> fantasy football, and I'm still wrong. So well, I've been uh, with you. All, out man. You've I been know. more outspoken, but I've always agreed. I've I've never been a Frank Gore guy ever. Um, I know, but I, I get the optimism on there. He has a higher ceiling for sure, and I hope he does. Uh, you know, I own a couple small shares of him some places, uh, but we talked about him in the preseason. We talked about him last podcast. I mean, you know, you just hope for – you hope to see him get the job because you'll, you like what you see in the kid. Uh, and, I mean, it's funny. I, we call people kid. I, I call people a kid uh, all the time now, and nobody's really a kid. I mean, fuck, I'm 26 years old. But, uh, you know, it's just – it's the wording. But regardless, yeah, yeah, best of luck on Marlon Mack. Frank Floor uh, stays a floor. Yeah. You know who else I sound like, Shrek? A potential front runner for the next Colts head coaching job. If Jim, Jim Irsay is listening out there, uh, you know, Matt Rogers, I'll throw my, head in the, I'll throw my hat in the ring. Let's, 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 let's get it going. I'll coach the Colts. <laughs> and, and there it is. There's always an angle. Rogers is always looking for it. Uh, you know, I see how it is. You lined me up for some, some help on uh, maybe an interview or two. And uh, next thing you know, you're, you're coaching the uh, Indianapolis Colts. So very, <laughs> very well played there, my friend. Very well played. Exactly. Uh, let's talk wide receivers then, Mr. Future uh, head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, T.Y. Hilton, Dante Moncrief. Um, he stays with the Colts. We heard rumors that T.Y. Hilton was going to get traded before the deadline. He did not. Um, you know, do you believe that both of these guys can be viable? We've, We've seen Moncrief. He had five targets over the last two weeks. Not a great, uh, a great stat. I mean, he played against some tough defenses, but still not great. Uh, do you trust either of these guys? Um, I wouldn't say that I necessarily trust them. Um, that sure. neither of these guys have more than one touchdown on the year. Right. I know the Colts' ba- the passing game has, has been, you know, rebuilding, if you will, without Andrew Luck. Uh, I think T. Y. Hilton again. We talked about Deshaun Jackson on that last podcast. He's got that home run potential. Uh, I think that he can work your way into a lineup. I put him as like a wide receiver three, uh, definitely less valuable in PPR, of course. But I think that he's a guy that uh, in a divisional game going against the Texans offense that is now suddenly bad, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, I think that uh, that T.Y. Hilton could could break one possibly. Dante Moncrief, on the other hand, no, I'm not into it. Uh, I think that, you know, d- Kamar Aiken to me is possibly more interesting. Uh, not that he is in any capacity, but – just for some context, I value them on the same plane right there. Fair enough. I'm with you on T.Y. Hilton. I think, uh, you know, this this uh, kind of line here comes from fantasy pros for those listening. But, you know, they liken his situation this week to Brandon Cooks going off uh, for 131 yards and two touchdowns, um, you know, against the Texans. So just something to uh, to watch with a similar speed. So I, I agree he could be break free here and uh, if not find the end zone, definitely rack up some yardage totals. Uh, Dante Moncrief uh, can wave goodbye. Let's talk about a tight end who has been surprising, um, to say the least, Jack Doyle. Uh, he's missed a game to a concussion, but with that, he still ranks fourth among tight ends in targets this year. Um, he's had 32 targets over the last three games, 25 catches for 215 yards and two touchdowns. Him and Brissett seem to have developed a bromance, if we will. Uh, he's, a, he's a tight end one. Play him. Yeah, absolutely. He's the only Colt, like we said, with multiple receiving touchdowns. He's caught at least five passes in his last six games, and we saw him blow up last week. He's definitely a tight end one. Uh, the Texans' biggest uh, biggest weakness, really, is against the tight end. They've given up a decent amount of touchdowns, I think four or something like that, which as far as you know, tight ends go, that's pretty, pretty decent. Uh, that defense a little bit banked up. So, yeah, Jack Doyle's a must-play for sure. Which is absolutely incredible because for a while we thought we were going to write off the Colts for dead completely. And we do have some fantasy value. Um, let's flip this over to the Houston Texans side. We got the heartbreaking news on the last podcast. Excuse me, that the Sean Watson tears his ACL. Um, he is done for the year, and we wish him the best. Uh, silver lining for those of you that didn't listen to last week's podcast, which if you didn't, pause this one, go back, listen to it now. Uh, it was the ACL that he didn't tear in college. So uh, super, super small silver lining, as Rogers pointed out on the last podcast. Um, I think we can move right past the QB spot and go right into the the impact that this is going to have, essentially on the the receiving game. I mean, even the running backs. I mean, this is going to be oh, yeah. bad. So yeah, let's start. Let's absolutely. start. Let's start with the wide receivers, Rogers. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, Will Fuller. Fuller continued to defy logic with Deshaun Watson. Um, 
you know, you got to assume that as Walsh would say, regression is fucking real. And especially with this injury regression is going to be even realer. Absolutely. One point, one thing I want to point out is, you know, with the Texans passing game, like we said, Will Fuller has been completely touchdown dependent in a, in a weird, un, un, uh, non-normal, abnormal way, I should say. But when Sean Watson was playing, right, they, the two leading receivers in touchdown passes were DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller, both with seven. Nobody else had seven or more touchdown catches on the year. Guess how many career touchdown passes Tom Savage has, Shrek? In seven yeah. games, some of which some of which are with the uh, or in the playoffs. Actually, how many career touchdown passes does Tom Chat Savage have? I want to say seven, just for a second. You say the answer is zero. He has <laughs> never thrown a touchdown in the NFL. You could not have a more drastic drop off of fantasy value for Hopkins and Fuller right here. The way that I take this, I'll say this right now. Hopkins, I feel so bad for the guy because he finally got a quarterback that was going to feed him and he was making the most of it. And uh, he's back to Tom Savage. Fuller is not playable. Hopkins is the only guy in this passing game you can consider playing. And Tom Savage absolutely blows. Zero touchdown passes in his whole career, Shrek. I feel like this guy's been around for a long time. That is that is unbelievable. That's why I was like, ah, it's got to be at least seven. Like the symmetry right. set me up for it. And no, it's a, it's a yeah. fat zero. Yes. Um, that's uh, that's sad. Very sad um, for for him. Uh, you know, for a guy that's got to retire with zero touchdowns because you know he's not going to throw any now. You got to keep the number at zero um, to have a career with zero touchdowns, and uh, that just kills you. DeAndre Hopkins, Will Fuller, very very sad. Um, you know, if you own either of them, uh, that sucks. I hope you sold high on Will, Ful- uh, Will Fuller, but you probably didn't. Um, and at this point, you can't trade him for anything. So. The regression is here, and you didn't even have to wait for it. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a shame because we'll never know if it really would have gone the way that that logic and Walsh, which Walsh is kind of symbolic of logic, I would say, as far as his yeah. podcast goes, especially. Uh, I wish we could have just seen him get his uh, validation in being completely right because that's just how the world should work. It is, but unfortunately, Walsh has been robbed of that, uh, just like uh, we watched Alfred Morris get robbed in our other league uh, after Walsh's symbolic update. So. <laughs> But alas, I'll digress on that since no one else knows what we're talking about. Um, and let's let's just touch on the running game here, I guess. Lamar Miller, uh, Dante Foreman. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think you can depend on anything in this offense right now because you've got oh. – uh, yeah, I think the Colts run defense is so bad. I think Lamar Miller's are like one of the best running back plays of the week, actually, because they might be stacking the box against him, but the Colts stacking the box means literally nothing. Uh, Tom Savage, Tom Savage certainly isn't going to be throwing the ball 35 plus times a game. I think this is a big, big Lamar Miller game. The Colts have given up the most rushing touchdowns at eight. Um, I, you know, just logic points to points to Lamar Miller having a good game and, and it's got to happen. So something is right. You're right. There, there is something good, I guess. Lamar Miller. This could be like uh, the Jordan Howard game with the Bears throwing the ball like 12 times total, and uh, you know Jordan Howard and uh, Tariq Cohen just were fed um, essentially. So definitely, uh, I agree. You're right. It's a, uh, it's a good play here. It's going to be interesting moving forward, though. Outside of this game, what happens with the Texans as a whole? Yep. Um, with that, I don't think there's anybody else to discuss. Uh, nope. Let's let's pick him. We taking Rodgers. This is going to be hard, but I think I'm going to take the Indianapolis Colts. I think somehow Jacoby Brissett, because uh, he's actually the better quarterback in this game. I think he finds a rushing touchdown for sure in this game. I'm calling that, and uh, Jack I, Doyle's going to go off. I agree. Doyle's going to go off, and I think Marlon Mack finds the end zone. This is going to be a Colts uh, a Colts W. Uh, I'm with you 100. percent with that, let's move on forward to the Washington Redskins at the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, total for points, 45. Uh, Seattle by seven is what the uh, the books are telling us. And my computer is freezing up on me, so give me one second. Actually, kick, can you kick us off here, Rogers, with the yeah. Washington Redskins? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about the Washington Redskins. Not a great matchup at Seattle, despite seeing uh, the Texans just completely wreck them in that shootout, which you never really see many shootouts in Seattle. But uh, – uh, one thing I will say about the Redskins, it's 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 pretty short, pretty short summary for me. Uh, Kirk Cousins still a quarterback one, low end because it's still not a great matchup despite Deshaun Watson's uh, freakish nature of being just phenomenal. Oh, I'm so sad. I'm just so sad about that. But that's I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, you still got to play him. There's only one, or I'll say two other Redskins that I'm even considering playing. 
One of them is Chris Thompson, obviously, and the other one is Vernon Davis. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Jordan Reed is uh, still not practicing. He's made of glass, uh, probably won't or shouldn't play. And even if he is active, I still think Vernon Davis is the only pass catching option that doesn't come out of the backfield that I am trusting. Thoughts? I'm, I'm 100% with you because we, we, I think we might have been on the podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. I definitely was on with somebody. I think it was with you when we talked about how anyone that owned Jordan Reed should immediately go out and get Davis. Um, yes. Because when one was out or the other, that they were a viable play. Um, because we've seen Kirk like the tight end. We've seen what Reed can do when he's in theory healthy and actually plays football. Um, and I think Davis is definitely going to see the targets and volume here uh, in the game. So I think he's a good, he's a great tight end. And I think that's a guy that you can grab off the waiver wire uh, to fill that spot. If, if you're in need of a tight end here. Absolutely. And just for some context, I mean, the reason why I'm bl- I'm going to blanket these guys real quick, but Terrell Pryor barely see in the field, isn't even ownable. I think in even a 10 team standard redraft league um, or even a deeply for that moment, I, I, sh- I should say like a 12 team redraft league. Um, Josh Doxson doesn't get a high target share and is completely touchdown dependent. The only times he's been relevant is when he's caught like two passes, one for a touchdown. And, uh, Jamison Crowder had coming off a big week. I think it's extremely fluky. The dude has done jack shit before this. Uh, do you agree, disagree with any of that? Or I I think, I, I think you still have to own Terrell Pryor. I don't think you can straight up cut him yet. Um, that's I, I don't really have a – Really? I, I, I mean, the last game, he didn't even see the field till like, the second half, it felt like. He's not even getting – I feel like he's playing, like, 30% of the snaps, if that. They do throw to him in the end zone apparent, occasionally, but I'd honestly rather own Josh Doxson. Uh, I mean, I guess you're right. I'm just getting – my screen's just holding up. He played 49 of a possible 123 snaps over the last two weeks. I, I guess you're right. I guess I have to walk back my my not being super happy about that. Um, I mean, since week one, he's only, he has not had more than three catches in a game, uh, only and excluding week one, he's only gone over 50 yards one time. And that was when he caught a long touchdown. Uh, the, the snap counts not there. It's, it's, it's one thing when, you know, you got a receiver that's just, you know, not getting targeted. Or I'm trying to think of someone comparable to this situation, like a, uh, you know, um, let me think like when Amari Cooper was playing bad, he was still on the field all the time. T- Terrell Pryor is, it, and, and he's even made comments where he said, "I'm not even really sure what's wrong, and I got to bear grit, you know, grit down and play yeah. football." And and you know, this is a guy that's not a natural wide receiver, so you know, he had success on the Browns, and that's what everyone's drafting him for and banking on. And you know, this is a team that doesn't really need him to win and be successful. And and I don't think that uh, that he's a guy that they feel like they need to force onto the field. You, you know what? You're right, and you've talked me back. Caught him. Cut him, cut him, cut him, and watch him have the game of a lifetime. Yeah, um, but because the last thing I'll say is, when, when, if you owned him, when would you ever play him? No, you're right. I mean, you talked about it two on weeks, last, two weeks, two weeks, right? You you talked about it on you know on the previews here where you're like uh, we answered it in the questions I think at the end of preview one where you said I'd honestly in most cases rather go to the waiver wire than play one of these guys that I've stashed on my bench, and this is a prime yeah. case of where you'd probably rather go do that. Um, so you're right. Get rid of Terrell Pryor. Um, and I think if you were going to roll with somebody here, um, it's probably Jamison Crowder just based on, I think they're going to have to throw the ball a lot, um, which puts him in the best spot, I think, out of the guys here. I agree. I'd, I'd pick him over everyone just for volume. Yes, I agree. I don't think it's not a great matchup, but he's the best out of the bunch. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, I'm just, I'm just looking, I just got my stats up for, Vernon Davis, uh, he has more fantasy points than Reed despite having 13 fewer targets. Um, so, yep, you're playing Davis, 100%. Let's flip it over and talk. Uh, did we talk about everybody on the uh, – No, we got to get to that backfield backfield real there quick. Robert um, Kelly and Chris Rob Ke- Yeah, yeah, Rob Kelly's still banged up. Uh, he's still just got like a modest role in this backfield. It's obviously Chris Thompson is the bell cow. He's the only other, uh, he's the only other red skin I'm playing. It's Kirk. Thompson is a must play. Uh, you may be strong armed into playing Rob Kelly, but the workload just isn't necessarily there yet as they're sort of coddling him back from injury. I a hundred percent agree. Uh, Thompson, he's carved out his role there. Uh, Rob Kelly, you're hoping he, he falls into the end zone. That's really all it is that he falls yeah. something at the line. Uh, really the only value yeah. for him uh, in that backfield. Let's flip it over. Let's talk about the Seahawks side of the ball. Russell Wilson, he's now scored at least 26 fantasy points in four of his last five games, which is super – it's huge for fantasy owners. I was someone who was panicking in the beginning of the year. We were concerned that Russell Wilson may actually be bad 
um, and because the Seahawks look bad, but they seem to be making things happen. He's throwing them all be- the ball more than ever. Is on pace for 590 pass attempts, uh, which is 44 more than his previous career high. Um, Redskins are also uh, not great defending the middle of the field, which the Seahawks are very good at. So Wilson is an elite uh, QB1 this week. Yeah, I completely agree. That's all I really got to say about that. Um, running backs for the Seahawks, Thomas Rawls and Eddie Lacy. Uh, both have been brutal, I think, to say the least. Um, I don't really think I want any of them in my, in my uh, season-long lineups. Yeah, no, not even on my rosters personally. I mean, I personally think J.D. McKissick is, is the best option there, and that's just because he's got the biggest pl- big play potential, it seems. Uh, I don't want to touch any of these guys. It's It's worthless. Fair enough. Doug Baldwin, uh, he comes out. He doesn't have a big uh, stat line from, from week eight, and I think I expected him to have a much better game. Um, but I think he makes up for it here against the Redskins. They have issues defending slot wide receivers and tight ends over the middle of the field. Uh, I expect a big week bounce back for Doug Baldwin. You were playing him anyway, but I think he has a, a bounce back from last week's okay performance. Okay, you think Josh Norman shadows him? Curious. Um. I think Tyler Lockett sees more of Josh Norman than Doug Baldwin does. Okay. Um, I, I, I really don't know. So this is just speculative on my part. I wanted to get your, your opinion. I don't think that's wrong. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I, again, do I have any statistics to back it up? No, I just think, I think Tyler Lockett ends up in the slot um, a little bit more. Um, and I just think he'll take Josh Norman, which opens up the opportunities for where we could see Paul Richardson. Again, my savior last week, he got me the win. Uh, picked up off the waiver wire, just kind of figured I'd stack him with Russell Wilson, and it worked out. Um, you know, so he's got five touchdowns in six games. I, I think Baldwin and Richardson – well, Baldwin's a good play. I think Richardson, I mean, with those kind of stats, who knows what's going to happen. But Yeah, I absolutely agree. And Shrek just wanted to, uh, wanted to interrupt for a second and give you a little uh, tidbit, but Bilal Powell just had a 51-yard run. Oh my God, that makes me feel at least, at least like I don't have to, you know, go into my bedroom and just, you know, throw up for hours after playing him yes. for 1.5 points. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh God. All right. Well, that's something, Bob. I'll find the end zone and, and we'll have a much better day. But I appreciate that uh, breaking news uh, update. Sorry, as you uh, said, that Forte did, but let's move on. <laughs> uh, great. Um, <laughs> oh God, damn it. What, uh, do you have anything else on the wide receivers here for the Seahawks? Uh, no, not really. No. All right. And Jimmy Graham. it well. If you're, uh, you're, you own Jimmy Graham, I think you're playing Jimmy Graham. Yeah, you got to play Jimmy Graham. But can I just ask that, like, he's looked bad at football even in his bad weeks. And has there ever been a bigger fall off of, like, one of the best players in football going to another team and just completely losing his skill set? Dude, and, and that's what's crazy is he came back, and it's not like it was because of the injury where you very rarely see players come back from injuries like that. He came back and bounced back from the injury of the health-wise. He just hasn't looked like Jimmy Graham. So, yeah, it's been uh, definitely a disappointment. But – good matchup and if you own him you're playing him for sure all right let's pick him i am gonna take the seattle seahawks you know what it goes against logic and i kind of just want to get interesting i'm gonna pick the redskins i think kirk slings a little bit okay fair enough i think uh russell wilson continues his elite uh fantasy performance that's also my bias hoping owning russell wilson but i'll digress um and let's jump into the arizona cardinals at the san francisco 49ers um, and for the Cardinals side of the ball, Drew Stanton at QB, Carson Palmer, obviously down with the injury. Um, yeah, that's, that's as much as I need to talk about the QB situation. You agree? Yeah. All right, great. So he, he just cracked open three more beers. Um, I did. <laughs> right, right into the running back situation. Adrian Peterson, Andre Ellington. Um, you know, Palmer being hurt obviously is bad for the offense as a whole. Uh, it makes AP a little bit less valuable. He still gets the carries, but, uh, you know, they're playing the 49ers. Um, so I think uh, you could have worse options. He's probably a low end running back, too, I think, here. I agree. Let me ask you a question, though, because I agree with your AP stance. Andre Ellington missed a little bit of time. Are you interested in that at all? Let me give you a stat first. The 49ers have given up the most receptions the most receiving yards and the most receiving touchdowns to running backs this season so far. I was going to say yes, but like hesitantly. And then with that said, I'm going to say, yes, I am interested in Andre Ellington. Plus I'm thinking Drew Stanton dump offs all day. Like whenever I look at a good receiving running back against a bad, you know, defense covering that with a really shitty, scared, probably shitless quarterback, it intrigues me. (laughs) Mostly the scared shitless quarterback. 
Um, but definitely, right. definitely intriguing. Yes, I, I agree. That That is a very interesting uh, very because interesting thing to not to digress, but as shitty as it is, these are decisions people are faced with. I hope I, I know it's not just me deciding like between Marlick Mack and Andre Ellington and shit like that. Like this week blows. Like we I, I we've talked about it, but I cannot overstate it enough how how hard this week is going to be to navigate for so many fantasy teams. Yes, you're 100 percent right. This is these are real decisions that real people are making, um, and that is uh, you know people look people mock fantasy football because they say it's not real. This is very real. This is a real as real as it gets right here making decisions between Andre Ellington and Marlon Mack. So we wish you all the best. And I'm assuming you're rolling with Marlon Mack here between the two choices, which is why he's in your lineup. I am, but, you know, I'm definitely tossing and turning at night over it for sure. And, and you will until the games are all done and, and locked in after, uh, yep. after this week. And they each tie and they each tie with 1.5 PPR points. <laughs> We may, we may be, we may be sending out an obituary for for Matt Rogers after uh, next week's games, depending on how Correct. things play out. Um, let's talk about the wide receivers: uh, Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown. Um, Fitz has been a guy who's helped carry teams. I mean, he's put up performances like the Larry Fitzgerald of old, myself included, especially in daily. He's been huge for me when I play him, particularly against Walsh. He plays really well. Um, you know. He didn't play really well against the 49ers in the first game of the season. He had 13 yards at the end of regulation. He got the touchdown um, in overtime, but it was kind of not a great performance. He's probably a wide receiver three here. Uh, again, matchup, and you don't know what's going to happen. I think a lot of dump-offs here to the running back. Yep. But you probably have, you have to play fits. I can't imagine with the guys we're talking about that you can bench him. Absolutely. And, you know, between him and DeAndre Hopkins are the two most screwed over elite receivers over the last five years, as far as quarterbacks go, I feel like completely. Yes. Um, and, uh, but yeah, you got to roll them out there. I think. I a hundred percent agree. John Brown. Uh, do you have any interest in him? Uh, I, so, I, so Shrek, I don't mean to keep making this about me, but in the league that I am seven <laughs> and one and I am starting Curtis Samuel and Marlon Mack, I am also starting John Brown. All of these guys were picked up this week. I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm 7-1 and one in this league. Fan favorite Walsh just texted me and said, hey, man, just saw your lineup in that league. I would think that you were a 3-5 and five team instead of a 7-1 and one team. What the hell happened? So, so, no, I'm not interested in him. Does that mean that I'm not going to play him? No. So I don't love it. The, the matchup is decent, but oh, god damn. Fair, fair enough. Um, well, tell Walsh he could just listen to the podcast to hear how you really feel. Um, and yes. uh, yeah, I mean, he really just needs one play to hit value. But uh, just a note for those that may consider John Brown: there's been 12 games in which Brown has played with Stanton, where Stanton has thrown at least five pass attempts. In those games, he's averaged 3.1 receptions for 40.2 yards and 0.2 touchdowns. So, for whatever whatever that's worth, I mean, again, it's a sp- <laughs> super small sample. I also find it funny that they're, they're, that Drew Stanton is one of the few quarterbacks that you would have to clarify games that he has had more than five pass attempts. <laughs> that, that is sad. That is super yeah. sad. He, he can yeah. just join the, the zero touchdown club and just retire, I guess. Um, yep. You're right. That is that is very, very <laughs> sad. Um, we don't want anything to do with the tight end uh, here, so we're just going to skip right over, and we're going to go back to the other side of the ball, the, the San Francisco 49ers, C.J. Bethard. Um you know, we're not going to see Garoppolo uh, go this Whoa. week. That was Garoppolo. that was a that was a little Freudian slip right there. So you, we're not going to see Garoppolo. Yeah, Might like, be I, one of the best like sl- slip of the tongues I've ever heard. And I just I just kept going. You see, I didn't try and like slow down and yeah. I was just like, all right, I'm just going to ignore it, and I'm going to continue to do so because I'll mess his name up again. <laughs> um, yep. But uh, yeah, you're not. I'm not playing with either of these QBs in this game. Yeah. No. Running backs, Carlos Hyde and Matt Breda. Uh, another down week for Hyde. 132 rushing yards on his last 47 carries over the last four games. Uh, the touchdowns have kept him somewhat valuable, but uh, not great. Uh, Cardinals run <laughs> defense. That, that's really what I got. Not great. I, I He's a running back too, especially. Yeah, yeah. Team. Yeah, your your the, your sadness in in the, in the inflection of your voice, I completely agree with, and I just feel the same exact way. So yeah, you got to play hide, but that's about it. Here, the stats are bad, but you've got to do it anyway. Um, so roll a dice, and then 
the wide receiver game, uh, I think you alluded to having somebody here. Pierre Garçon obviously goes to the IR. We talked about that um, on the part one preview, but who picks up the slack here for the 49ers? Uh, I'm not really sure now. I'll say this, that uh, right before we found out Pierre Garçon was out for the year, which was really close to when we started this podcast, I had a huge note in all caps that Marquise Goodwin was my flyer play of the week because I'm also playing him in a league that we are, that we are in. I, my, my thought process was that Patrick Peterson would shadow Garcon. Um, yeah. You know, the 49ers would go down and, and Goodwin, you know, he's a little bit banged up uh, coming off an injury and, and also a zero catch game. Uh, I, I would like to think that Patrick Peterson wouldn't shadow Marquise Goodwin because that's just insulting to him. But you would think that him and possibly George Kittle would be the biggest beneficiaries of this situation. Yes. If there is any. Yep. I, I agree. Um, and I guess that means George Kittle is a, he could be a tight end, uh, tight end option for you as you go into the week, if you need to stream. Uh, I mean, he's had six targets of, over the last two weeks, total of three catches for 38 yards. Um, but again, you lose Garcon, um, the ball's got to go somewhere. So yeah. Do you mind if I do a little name game with you with a couple guys with Marquise Goodwin? Go for it. Marquise Goodwin or Devonte Parker. Devonte Parker. All right, let me let me get a little harder then. Marquise Goodwin or Jamison Crowder? Marquise Goodwin. Okay, and then let me just throw out one more. Marquise Goodwin or Tyler Lockett? Just to gauge where I want to gauge where everybody, you know, and then yeah. the last one I was going to do was because I've agreed with you so far, and I want to just last one Marquise Goodwin, Mike Wallace. Just to gauge the context mm-hmm. of everyone else that we've talked I about think on the I'm, I think I'm going to go Goodwin over Lockett because we talked about him with Norman. Again, we'll see what happens to Peterson. We don't know. Um, but I think uh, I would do that over Lockett because I think Lockett is not a big factor with, between Baldwin, Jimmy Graham, and Richardson there. Um, and it sucks that I have to even justify that answer. Right. Um, and then the last one was, I'm sorry, Wallace. Wallace, yeah, just so, just so, like you know, anyone that's listening kind of knows the context of. I think that Marquise Goodwin is a, is a decent start this week I think as a I, wide receiver. I like I'd put him as a high wide receiver four, low end three, though. But okay. you know, I think I'd probably go Wallace, even though it's not a good matchup. Okay, but I uh, I don't know. I'm like fifty fifty on that. I just think the Niners are going to be down so quick and have to be throwing the ball a lot. Um, also Bilal Powell just had like another 25, 30 yard run. So you're doing well, Shrek, right, but cool. let's move on from this disgusting Niners situation. Yeah. That, and, and talking about having to use the Jets running back is uh throw up worthy enough. Let's, let's pick this game. Uh, oh, I didn't even think about it until I said, pick it. Um, I, I might throw up picking this game. I'm going to take whew, this San Francisco 49ers. Last week with Vinny, I called ties for a lot of gross games. This one is tempting to do that. But I think I'm just going to go with the Cardinals because their defense is better. And I honestly think the defense – both defenses might score both more than both offenses in this game. That is fair enough. I, there's no, no disagreement uh, on my end at all. Uh, Rodgers, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk Kansas City Chiefs at the Dallas Cowboys. This year, dominate your friends with free play-by-play fantasy football from Bench Boss. Bench Boss is the first play-by-play fantasy football game where you must think like the players and coaches on the field as you predict the outcome of every play. Earn rewards as you compete against friends and fans across the country. Bench Boss is currently recruiting beta testers, and we need you. Visit BenchBoss.tv to learn more and sign up today. All right, guys, we are back. That was Bench Boss. You can sign up for the beta now by going to letstalkfantasyfootball.com backslash Bench Boss. They are getting ready to roll out beta testing to even more users. We want to get you guys on that list. You can call plays before they happen, just like Tony Romo does on TV. And Vinny, our own Vinny <laughs> Gonzalez was doing it, and he thought he was Tony Romo. He was sending us Snapchats of himself, calling himself Tony. And, uh, you know, he pretty much thinks he's now uh, the former QB god, Tony Romo. So, We'll see if we can get you guys into football glory, just like uh, Tony. I mean, Vinny uh, experience. <laughs> Certainly, just as injury prone. Just as injury prone, Vinny and Romo for sure. Definitely, they go hand in hand. I mean, whenever I think of Romo, I think of Vinny. When I think of Vinny, I think of Romo. So they're it's pretty much <laughs> interchangeable. Uh, but with that, let's talk about the Kansas City Chiefs and Romo's former team, the Dallas Cowboys. But first, we're going to start on the Chiefs side of the ball. 
Super happy about how the Chiefs look this year. The over under, uh, the total, I'm sorry, 51.5 points for the game. So they expect this to be a pretty high scoring affair. Uh, Alex Smith uh, has looked really, really good. Um, and if you own Alex Smith, I think he's in your lineup. It's going to be uh, a game that should have a high total scoring. I agree. I mean, they haven't had the buy yet, but he's QB1, if I'm not mistaken. You got to roll him out there. Yep. 100%. Roll him out there. Yeah, they go on the, the buy next week. We, we discussed that one, but you own him. You're rolling him out there for sure. Uh, Kareem Hunt, uh, running back. He's come back to earth a little bit. We talked about this pre podcast, um, but he's clearly the guy. Um, and I think he gets back on track here against the Cowboys. They've allowed opposing teams running backs over 20 PPR points in five of their seven games. Uh, Hunt dominates 90% of the Chiefs scoring. And, uh, you know, you expect him to do that uh, in this game here. So roll him out there with confidence. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I'm going to let you roll with this. The, 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 you're a Chiefs fan, and the Chiefs are clear cut to me. So you roll with it, man. Keep going. Cool, man. Tyree Kill. Uh, he's seen six, seven, and eight targets in every single game this year. Or, I'm sorry, six, seven, or eight targets in every single game this year. Uh, you know, in good matchup, he, he tends to play really well. When he has bad matchups, he just tends to play bad. So he's kind of pretty much by the book. When he's got a bad matchup, he doesn't play well. Um, I think he's in a good matchup here against the secondary that it's already allowed five performances of 17 or more PPR points through seven games. He's a high end wide receiver too, for me, he's going to have a nice, uh, a very nice week. I think someone to monitor. I don't think it's someone you need to, you're playing here. Demarcus Robinson, uh, 13 targets in, in two games, uh, for the Chiefs. So we'll see if it continues, but I think it's just an interesting name for people to have on their radar. Um, don't plug him in quite yet. Travis Kelsey, if you own him, you're starting him. Uh, he's looked great. Uh, he has his down weeks, but uh, you're playing him here. You don't have a better option. And that's that does it for me on the Chiefs side of the ball. Is there anybody else you want yeah. to talk about? No, man. That's exactly how I feel. All right, man. Chief, it feels good. It feels good to finally have some good things to say about Kansas City. For sure. Flip, let's flip over to the other side and talk about the Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott. Um Let's. I'll let, I'll let you talk about the Cowboys a little bit. So I just ranted on the Chiefs. Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll talk about Dak first, I guess. I mean, he's still a QB one. Um, you know, the quarterback, the quarterback schedule for him is uh, not as bad as it seems. Really, going forward, there's some rough matchups coming up, but with Zeke being likely suspended now, I really, I mean, Walsh and Vinny kind of talked about it, and I yeah. sort of echo their sentiment of like. I don't really know what the hell is going on, but like, I'm just listening to all these facts. Like he's appealing. I don't know what's going on. I'm expecting, I think the kind of consensus that he's not going to play. So, you know, Dak is going to throw a little more. Dak may run a little more. Uh, It's sort of on his shoulders a little bit, which is good. The chiefs, you would know this too, Shrek are uh, pretty bad against the pass. Actually, surprisingly. Once they lost, I mean, they weren't great. Um, Once they lost Barry, they went super downhill. Yeah, yeah, and it's not that they're bad, but they're certainly favorable matchup to to quarterbacks more yep. than uh more than you would think. And again, they're a defense that is way better in Arrowhead than they are on the road. They're going into Jerry World. I expect a little bit of a shootout here. We liked Alex Smith. I like Dak for the same exact reasons. A hundred percent. Four of the last seven QBs to play against the Chiefs were able to post twenty or more fantasy points. So I expect a very nice week from Dak Prescott here. Very nice week. Sweet ass on that. So let's get into the backfield first, right? You know what? Let's go to the wide receiver core because okay. let's let's save this backfield for last. Um, are you playing anybody but Des Bryant? Des Bryant, you got to roll out there. Um, no, I don't think Cole so. Beasley banged up. Yeah, yeah. And Terrence Williams gets Marcus Peters. He hasn't played as great as he typically is, but I, I don't think he. I think he's still playing well enough to keep Terrence Williams anywhere out of the conversation of being played here. I mean, absolutely. Again, I agree. As um, you know, he'll match up with uh, Terrence Mitchell. He's been burned a shit ton. So I think Brian actually could have a very, very nice week with Dak Prescott here. Absolutely. It's a great matchup. Uh, Jason Witten, I'd really rather not. Yes. Um, but, but you know, it's possible he could catch a touchdown. I think every other tight end that we've been on this sort of, you know, streamable tight end roulette thing, I prefer all of them over that. I prefer Tyler Higby over it. I prefer... Tyler Croft over it. I prefer George Kittle over it. I just don't really love Jason Witten this year in any capacity. I agree. The only thing I will say for anyone that considers Witten is that the uh, the Chiefs have now allowed 546 yards to the tight end position, which is the second most in the NFL uh, since they lost Eric Berry. So if you're going to roll Witten, that's you're really your only saving grace. Uh, like you said, he may score a touchdown. He may not. There's more upside elsewhere. Um, yep, but absolutely. If you want to roll Witten, it's not the worst move. Let's go back to the uh, the running back situation, which we, 
we nicely navigated around, but unfortunately we do have to talk about um, the running back spot with Alfred Morris. And I would say it's right now Alfred Morris and Darren McFadden. I know there's a third guy in play, but I think from what we've heard, Alfred Morris is going to be the guy that they want to start with here. We've yeah, been so doing- Alfred. No, no, go on, please. I, I don't want to talk about it. You go. <laughs> we've been big Darren McFadden fans. We've run the Darren McFadden fan club here at Let's Talk Fantasy Football. Um, but right now I just, I think Alfred Morris is really the only guy we, I advise someone to play Darren McFadden on the part one preview, just because I think there's a chance that if Morris doesn't get going, they could turn to McFadden and he could make it happen. But that's pure speculation at this point, pure speculation. Yeah. So Alfred Morris has been listed as the official starter and he's the, I mean, Darren McFadden hasn't even been active for most of the year. He's been a healthy scratch for, yep. for depth reasons. Um, but something that I will say is that from from what I've heard is there's certain people like, you know, beat writers for the Cowboys or people that, you know, follow the team closer than we do specifically that think that Rod Smith is actually the most talented running back or with the most upside out of that backfield. That being said, I think the way that this is going to go is Alfred Morris is going to be the starter. And I think this is going to be a fat committee, whack ass backfield situation where they give everybody a touch. Rod Smith, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this if this backfield split went 10, 7, and 7 in Morris, you know, Smith, and McFadden. And they're going to be a team that rides the hot hand, and I think they're going to ride the, ride the hot hand quick. Uh, it's going to be hard to navigate. I think if, if, if Alfred Morris, you know, goes on one drive and doesn't really do much and Rod Smith breaks a couple long runs, it's his job for at least a quarter and a half. I would prefer – sorry to rant for a second, but I would prefer not to touch any of them. If you are, it's only Alfred Morris. Yes. For now. I agree. I agree for now. It's only out for Morris. And that sucks because I, I would not be shocked in the least to see Smith with the big, biggest stat line at the end of this game. And I, I, clearly you wouldn't either. You know, the Chiefs have allowed 4.5 yards per carry and seven touchdowns through eight weeks on the ground. I don't see Alfred Morris, you know, maybe he grounds and pounds and grinds the defense down, but he's not making the cuts, the quick plays to break them and go for four and a half yards of carry. He's just not. Right. The Chiefs defense no. doesn't like elite. But, you know, that also come, plays to you play Le'Veon Bell. You play against some good running backs. That's not Alfred Morris. You right. know, that's, that's never been his style ever. No. So that's why, you know, like you said, you could see the hot hand very quickly turn to McFadden or Smith. And then based on what everyone probably makes that first big play or that first big cut, probably gets a shit ton of the work. And it's why right. I avoided, you know, trade talks this week when people approached about Alfred Morris. And I, I just don't believe that it's, it's – locked and loaded Alfred Morris as so many people do if you own all of them fine but otherwise you're rolling the fucking dice here absolutely the way that I would just sum it up is I think that they all three of them are rosterable more preferably so if you're a Zeke owner if you're not you don't have to take a chance on a Rod Smith necessarily or a Darren McFadden they're all rosterable though in any size or standard league but the only one that is possible to find a lineup is Alfred Morris and I would still try and find a better option if I could Absolutely, 100% agreed. Rogers, with that, uh, let's pick them. I'm taking the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay, I am going to pick the Dallas Cowboys solely because I'm really sad and I want everyone to be as sad as I am. <laughs> that is Including fair. Including you. That is, I, I, can re- I can respect <laughs> that, um, which I'll uh, right. spoil my pick them here. I almost want to say that I would pick the Dolphins against Walsh uh, just to make him sad, but I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> But let's talk about the Oakland Raiders and the Miami Dolphins. Um, We'll start on the Raiders side of the ball, Derek Carr. Um, We talked about him actually a bunch across the preview podcast as a streaming candidate. Um, You know, they don't – the Dolphins definitely don't have an elite pass defense. Uh, They've allowed at least one passing score in every game this season, uh, and they've allowed five touchdowns on 49 pass attempts to the combination of Josh McCowan, Joe Flacco, and Ryan Mallett. So Derek Carr, a very streamable guy here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm all about this passing game for sure. I'm in on Cooper. I'm in on Crabtree. I'm in on Jared Cook as the as the higher end of that tight end roulette that we've talked about. Totally with you. Uh, there, do you want to dive into any of these guys specifically that you just kind of rattled off or we want to move? Um, not in particular. Uh, Jared Cook isn't a must start if you feel comfortable with another tight end. But I think Cooper and Crabtree, uh, you know, we saw Cooper have that blow up game. The volume was still there with the targets following that, which was encouraging. Same goes for Crabtree. Uh, I think he had something like, forget the exact target share, but it was 83 yards in the last game or something like that. It was, it was, a, good, it was a good line. Yep. Uh, I think they're both must plays. I agree. Totally agree. Um, all right, let's talk. 
I guess we have to talk about the running backs here in uh, in Oakland, right? I mean, Marshawn Lynch, DeAndre Washington, Jalen Richard. Uh, it's a great matchup, um, but it's it's a mix of what happens with Lynch. We saw Washington get in the end zone. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Originally, when Lynch was uh, when Lynch got ejected from that game, uh, Richard and Washington split the touches. Essentially, uh, I know Richard had a pretty crucial fumble in the last game. Like you said, Washington finds the end zone. I'd rather not touch any of these guys. Marshawn Lynch is a huge disappointment. Uh, he is not. He's not putting together the yardage to justify. He's he's the most touchdown dependent guy since Legarrette Blunt of old, or even now, if you will. Wow. Uh, I'd prefer to not touch any of these guys. You nailed that. I don't think you. Marshawn Lynch is. Yeah, I don't think he's had a uh, a game over like six fantasy points, even in PPR, where he hasn't scored. Uh, you nailed that compare. He's just like Garrett Blunt. Uh, I have nothing further to add. Nailed it. Let's talk about QBs on the flip side of the ball. Uh, he's gotten a lot of time on the air here. Jay Cutler. <laughs> um, can we move on from Jay Cutler? I missed what you said there. Oh, okay. I think my headphones fell out on purpose. That must have been it. But I think you asked me about Jay Cutler. So I can't believe that we're fucking confronted with this fucking shit fucking again. Those are the only F-bombs I'm going to drop on this podcast. Here's an interesting tidbit, though. So Jay Cutler, the king of interceptions. I'm pretty sure he owns hefty stocks in interceptions. Um, he has thrown an interception in every game he has played in since their first one in week two. And the Raiders are the only team in the NFL to not yet have an interception. So this is a matchup of shitty versus shitty. And I, all I know is I will never fall on the side of Cutler. He's not streamable coming off of an injury. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, that's all I have to say about Jay Cutler. I, I don't even want to talk about him anymore. Let's move on. Um, we're going to go right over to – let's skip the running back situation for a minute and talk uh, wide receivers, Devontae Parker, Jarvis Landry. Um you know, Devontae Parker, uh, he's told in his three full games that he's played, uh, he's totaled four for 85, eight for 76 in the touchdown, and six for 69. Um, he gets a ton of targets from Jay Cutler. I think <laughs> if you own him, uh, you, you have him in your lineup, particularly in a bad week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Alshon Jeffrey got a pretty much a fat contract from the Eagles because Jay Cutler in the past is just willing to chuck up balls to top tall receivers because he doesn't know what the hell else to do. So I like Devontae Parker's ability to potentially find the end zone or a big catch from Jay Cutler just floating one the hell up there. Uh, fair enough. And Jarvis Landry, same thing. Seen 10 targets in six of seven games. Uh, just on volume alone in PPR leagues, he should be in your lineups. Um, Absolutely. I feel like every Jay Cutler, not to rant on him, but I feel like every Jay Cutler pass is either like longer than 30 yards or less than five in this Dolphins offense. Yeah, you're right. You're hundred percent. That sucks. Um, Kenny Stills. <laughs> mm-hmm. I also think I, we need to say is a desperation play. I think with uh, Parker back healthy, his share is going to completely drop off. Yep. I agree. Um, Julius Thomas. Do we believe any value here? No, not at all. Don't do that to yourself or to anyone that you know. We we talked about Jared Cook. We've talked about a bunch of other options. Uh, look at them uh, versus tight end here for the Dolphins. All right, Rodgers. Again, two back-to-back games where we don't want to have to do it, but we have to. Let's talk about the running backs, uh, Kenyon Drake and Damian Williams. Um, the Dolphins must have a plan, or maybe they're just they – they got some of that coke before they fired their coach. Um, <laughs> to trade Jay Ajayi away. Um, according to beat writers, Drake has taken the lead, taken on the lead role when Ajayi missed time in practice. Um, this regime regime selected him in the third round just one year ago. So based on that, it would lead me to believe that Drake is probably the guy, but I don't really know anything outside of that. Yeah, I think this is even harder than the Eagles situation that we alluded to in the last situation where I don't want to touch any of this at all. Uh, I'm sure one of them will have some sort of value. I have a conspiracy theory that the Dolphins organization found out that Jay Cutler was coming back and was so upset that uh, they just wanted some terrible pass-blocking running backs in the backfield with Jay Cutler so he would potentially get hurt again and not have to play. That is what I hope is true. It's not true. But I don't want to touch any of these guys yet whatsoever. I agree. A wait and see situation for sure. With that, Rodgers, let's go into pick them. I'm going to take the Oakland Raiders. Yeah, I'll double down on that. Let's do it, Raiders. Let's move into the Detroit Lions at the Green Bay Packers. Um, and let's start on the Lions. Night football. Yes, yes, hell yeah. 
We're going to start on the Lions side of the football, um, and I'll let you totally run with the Green Bay side, but let's do Detroit first. Um, Matthew Stafford um, comes out. He plays the rival Packers. Um, the Packers have actually been pretty decent, right, against QBs, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, they've been better. They're, they're, they're getting a little bit healthier in their secondary. Uh, their defense, they're just banged up all over. Demorius Randall is going to be playing this game, even though he's been limited in practice. Morgan Burnett also banged up with a hamstring injury. Uh, they've been relatively decent, but Stafford seems to have their number year in and year out. Like Dom Capers just – doesn't really know what to do about him. Uh, I think that he's going to have his best game of the year. Uh, I know Stafford has had a pretty pedestrian uh, point total week in and week out. I I'm, I, I think that he's going to put up 25-plus. I think the Lions go up early as, as, as upsetting as it is. And the Packers' defense does not play as well when they're playing from behind. So keep in mind that they were, they were, they were better against quarterbacks in the early part of the year because Aaron Rodgers could keep them in games. When they, when they end up going down and they have to worry about the run, they're big play. They're, they're very susceptible to the big play. Fair enough. Yeah, the only thing I, you know, uh, Stafford, again, if he's on your wire, guys, great streaming QB. We've alluded to that throughout the preview podcast. Um, you know, for stats there, he's thrown for more than 340 yards in each of their two meetings last year. Um, the Packers defense has been, uh, okay, uh, this year, allowing one or less passing touchdowns in five of seven games. So, uh, as a guy who's going against Stafford, that's my one sole hope that maybe he just throws for one. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about the running game here. Maybe that they get a few in on the ground. Um, let's talk about the running game. I mean, Abdullah, Theo Riddick, uh, Dwayne Washington, Abdullah seems they want to make him a thing. You know, he's got 101 carries through seven games. Um, the offensive line hasn't been doing a, a great job there to really help him out. Um, but he's going to get volume, and the Packers defense is averaging just over, uh, allowing just over four yards per carry. Um, so that points to good things here for Amir. Yeah, absolutely. I think I forget whose question it was in the last podcast when they asked us something about Abdul. It was Chad through the email. Right. Uh, I'm sort of going to echo that where I think the Lions will go up early in this situation. I think that, like you said, they're going to want to make a point of Abdullah getting work and, and having success in this situation and hopefully, you know, slowly closing out this game. And like you said, there's there's obviously a point that they're doing this because Theo Riddick has been one of their best overall football players the last few years, and they're just not using him as much. And with, you know, bad stat lines, they're still feeding Abdullah. So I think that they're going to make a point of doing this, and uh, I agree it's going to be a great game. I mean, a great game for uh, Abdullah. Yes. Yep, 100%. Wide receivers, Rodgers, Golden Tate, Marvin Jones. Um you know, Tate, uh, he played well last week, seven catches for 86 yards on eight targets. Um, you know, you got to think that you're playing Tate if you own him here. It's a, it's a good matchup. Absolutely. And another thing I want to say is I'm guaranteeing a Marvin Jones touchdown this week. I'm guaranteeing Okay. It. Fair enough. I, I've got yeah. nothing else to That's, add there. Yeah, yeah, not really go in depth, but their cornerbacks are just inconsistent. They're big play susceptible, like I said before. Marvin Jones is catching a touchdown this week. Fair enough. Um, I don't want anything to do with TJ Jones or Kenny Galladay as much as I like them early on. Um, it's just not – nothing that I'm going to roll the dice on here. Yep, I agree. All right, and then we're down to uh, – oh, wow, this guy, Eric Ebron. Um, I'm, I'm surprised he's even available in leagues right now. But if anyone wants him in leagues or in with me, um, I'm going to put him on the block just so you guys are aware if anybody wants him. Absolutely. It's really hilarious that this is a situation that you and me are talking about because there is one defense in football that has not allowed a receiving touchdown to a tight end, and it is the Green Bay Packers. Zero touchdowns to the tight end. So Ebron, who has always been a fat no for like the last six or seven weeks, continues to be a fat no. Uh, 100%. Sorry, Eric. Um, Let's move over to the Packers side of the ball, and Rodgers, take us away. Yeah, so one thing I'm going to say is Brett Hundley, uh, they're coming off the bye. I hope they have a great plan of something. Something that's a little discouraging is Brett Hundley did not look good when they played against the Saints. Uh, that one touchdown that he threw to Devontae Adams was very uh, like a broken down play that wasn't lucky, I would say. It was good awareness, but it just it wasn't a design play, anything like that. I'm really worried about the wide receiver value because Brett Hundley is not ownable, not startable, I don't think, yet at least, unless he turns a corner. But here's one thing I'll say. So Darius Slay down for the last few weeks at least. I don't really know who he's going to guard. So the common theme and the expectation is that he will guard Jordy. But realistically, throughout the year, most 
teams, most defenses have been putting their number one cornerback on Devontae Adams. So that being said, I don't really know. I, I think one of these, you know, one of these wide receivers of Adams or Jordy will have value because I don't know how the Lions coverage is going to go. I think they're both startable with very, very tempered expectations. Do you agree with that, Shrek? I agree. I was, just, I was looking at the same stats here with what's going to happen with Darius Slay. No one seems to know. It seems to be the consensus across many of the big big teams in the industry. So there has to be value somewhere. Which one it is, you're not going to know until you're playing the game. Absolutely. And the Lions, I think, except for one game, have a turnover in every single game, mostly interceptions. But, you know, it's just just not going to be a good game script. The the Lions defense has been sneaky good. Uh, I think that the Packers go down early. And hopefully that means something for Devontae Adams uh, or Randall Cobb. It's really going to be hard to tell. Some of the noted noted is that um, Martellus Bennett is expected to be out with a shoulder injury. Not that he was really a big factor, but, you know, Richard Rodgers and Lance Kendricks haven't really get, been getting a lot of work. I expect this to be a, a more uh, wide receiver-driven passing, effect, uh, passing attack. It's just I don't really know how it's going to go. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that Adams and Jordy Nelson are both wide receiver twos for me this week. Okay, fair enough. I, the only thing I, I do want to interject is actually, I have two things. One, we have breaking news coming in from Twitter. It says Packers QB Brent Hun, uh, Brett Hunley said he shot a deer in Jeff Janice's backyard during the bye week. Um, so we just want to make our listeners aware of that. Um, that one just oh, came cool. in. So uh, at least he's uh, accurate in some sort of capacity. So maybe that means good things to come. He worked on his accuracy on the bye week. Um, two yeah. is I think Randall Cobb is interesting um, because I think he may have been dropped by a bunch of people after what you know, the injury is and how he's kind of performed lately. The Lions have used uh, Quandre Diggs to cover slot receivers this year. Um, he's allowing a, a super high 15.8 yards per, per reception. Quarterbacks have a 131.2 rating when targeting him. Um, so, again, I don't know if that translates for Cobb or not. Um, but I think it could be interesting if you really need a dart throw. We've talked about about, about a lot of dart throws this week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would make sense that uh, the Packers, you know, they run that West Coast widespread offense with Aaron Rodgers, even keep the ball short on slants. It would make sense if they, you know, keep the ball short and over the middle. Yep. It's to- totally possible. A lot of unknowns, but that's kind of where we lean. Um, I guess uh, anything on the running Real game quick on this- with uh, yeah. Aaron Jones? Just uh, Aaron Jones is, like we said before, second in the league in yards per carry to Aaron Collins. Um, Ty Montgomery is getting a little bit healthier. But there was an interesting interview with Mike McCarthy, which is like this is totally overthinking it because I'm a Packers fan. But they were talking about how great Aaron Jones has looked. And, you know, going into the year, people were wondering about Jamal Williams, who was obviously hurt. And Aaron Jones was sort of an afterthought of even being drafted or anything like that, even though he was active on the roster. And um, people said that, you know, Ty Montgomery was the guy no matter what. Now that he's back and getting more healthy, people asked uh, Mike McCarthy and his presser yesterday, or uh, yes, it was yesterday, I believe, um, if we should still uh, expect that sort of, uh, you know, timeshare, I guess, between the two of them with Aaron Jones getting the work. And he made a comment saying, keep in mind, Ty Montgomery is not a natural running back. So his durability in that position is something to be monitored, which is something that they have never addressed or talked about at all during his tenure as their number one running back, which is essentially over the last two years. So that leads me to believe that Aaron Jones is still the guy. I mean, Mike McCarthy's always been a run first dude. So I expect that to continue. Aaron Jones has given them no reason to not feed him. And I think Ty Montgomery should still, I've seen him dropped in some leagues, should still be owned because I think they're going to want to work him back in. But I think it might be in a more hybrid slot wide receiver situation. I'd be shocked if we see him get double digit carries for the rest of the year, to be honest, in any game. Completely fair, man. That the comment there and, and quote from McCarthy is is super interesting, and I don't. I, and I'm not a Packers fan, so I, th- I don't think you're you're reading into that too much. I think that's actually maybe a tip of the hand a little bit. Um, and I yeah, think you're spot on. absolutely. And and then you know beforehand it was that was a thought of the whole fan base, but they they were like, no, Montgomery's our guy. He's our running back one. And now that they're sort of starting to come around to that to that story, um, it's something to definitely keep in mind. One hundred and ten percent. One hundred ten percent. Do you have any, anything else in this game, Rogers? Um, no, not really. All right, let's pick them. Uh, I'm going to assume uh, – who are you taking? Yeah, I got to go with the pack. That's fair uh, because you wish got- me to be sad. I'll return the favor. I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions. <laughs> yes, <a> totally fair, Shrek. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know it was coming. Um, let's move on to – we picked out three reader questions um, out of all the ones we've gotten in this week. First one comes in from Ryan. 
via the website. He says, since Ajayi has been traded to Philly, do you think – oh, this is a Thursday night game question, so it doesn't really matter. Um, sorry, Ryan, I'm going to throw out your Well, question. I think I – think, I, no, I think we can do it going forward, though. Like, okay. let's, let's, let's assume that it's after this week. Okay. So he says it's been traded to Philly. Do you think Vile Powell um, of the Jets would be a better starter in PPR leagues than Ajayi? Um, I feel Ajayi's workload will be low um, possibly until after Philly's bye week. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'll take it since I wanted to answer it. And I'll say yeah. if Jay Ajayi does not get the most carries on the Eagles this this week, I think that Bilal Powell going forward, regardless of the matchup, will be a better PPR start until we see Ajayi have a substantial role. Fair enough. It's, it's a, it's a whack-ass backfield where we literally have absolutely no idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fair enough. I will get on board with you there. Uh, Ryan, still get, still get a response. Uh, I know we shot you back an email earlier, but you still have a podcast one. This one comes from Daniel uh, via the website. He says, I'm in a 10-man league, and I got a trade offer. After the trades, the guy wants Christian McCaffrey for Kelvin Benjamin. What are your thoughts? Um, you want to take this one? Yeah, it says 10-man league. Uh, blah, blah, blah. He wants Christian McCaffrey for Kelvin Benjamin. I'm going to hold on to Christian McCaffrey, uh, particularly if it's a PPR league. Um, based on just the volume of that offense. McCaffrey is that offense there. Um, so I think I would rather have Christian McCaffrey out of the two. Yeah, I completely agree. And another just disclaimer I kind of want to say is don't make trades for or give anybody away of anybody that's just moved to a new team right now. Unless you really like – if you want to give away a Jai for a good buy or something like that, someone takes it. I don't want to trade for anybody that is just relocated. Yeah, because you don't know. You just don't yeah. know. Don't trade for Jai. Don't trade for Benjamin. Yeah, any anything like that. All right. Last question comes in. It comes in from Colin via the site. He says, uh, "I'm in a PPR league. Who should I start at flex? Marshawn Lynch, Sterling Shepard, or Joe Mixon?" And I think I know your answer, but I, I'm, I, I'm I can predict who I think you're going to take. I'm going to tell you in a PPR league to go with Sterling Shepard. Yeah, I would say for sure rule out Marshawn Lynch immediately. Um, I'm a little off Shepard, like we said in the last podcast. I would go Joe Mixon, but sh- on, on paper, Shepard's matchup is better. Yes, I so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Joe Mixon, and I'm not saying that that I feel great about it. Fair enough. I assume that's where you would go based on our Sterling Shepard conversation on uh, part one of the preview, but. Uh, totally, totally makes sense. All right, Rogers. Well, with that, that is part two of the preview co- podcast for week nine. For all you guys listening out there, we are now on iHeartRadio. You can also find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, you name it. Wherever you guys are looking for the podcast, we are there. Uh, give us a download. Leave us a review. Uh, just a little something. If you guys are looking to play <laughs> DFS on a new platform, you can play on Draft. You can find that at playdraft.com backslash Let's Talk. And uh, with that, uh, Rodgers, do you have anything else for the fans? Yeah, I want to say one more thing. I, I, I kind of feel this way, and I want to express it, that search in the waiver wire, be careful, do your research, and I feel like it's, it's, it's the same situation as the Titanic lifeboats going back after it had already sunk to all the frozen dead bodies. Just like, is there anyone alive out there? Please, like, can I pick up anyone to play on my roster? Like, it's going to be hard. Get through it. Um, is bye weeks suck. These injuries suck. And uh, just just overly stress and read everything you can. And there you have it, guys. You heard it here first. <laughs> just like the lifeboats, get in there, check out the waiver wire, and see if there's anybody you can snag. With that, guys, I am Nick Shrek. He is Matt Rogers for Let's Talk Fantasy Football. We will catch you on the flip side. This has been Let's Talk Fantasy Football. Thanks for listening. <laughs>